Hi, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. A lot of you have asked if uh, I would ever do a collaboration with Leighton Flowers. And it just so happens that he was kind enough yesterday to shoot me a text, it seemed like out of the blue to me, asked me if I wanted to come on his show. So uh, this is a recording of me coming on the Leighton Flowers show, which happened, it was streamed live earlier today, but there were a lot of technical difficulties. Um, so I apologize for that. So this recording... I wanted to record it so I could post it on this channel for you guys and uh, to try to maybe fix up a little bit some of the bad quality. I take full responsibility for the bad quality. I'm, I'm paying for Gigablast internet. It's supposed to be getting a gig download speed, 30 uh, megabits per second upload speed. And uh, I wasn't apparently wasn't getting that on the upload even though I tested it all before we did it. We tried all kinds of things like uh, turning off the... We turned off the background, we tried different cameras, tried three different devices as far as compu a computer, phone, a different computer, um, try, tried two different internet service providers, tried using you know the, the built-in camera versus the camera that I'm using, background, no background, we tried, we tried all that stuff. Could not, could not get a better quality to come in. So um, the first half of the video is the recording that I did here, so that quality is going to be decent in this video. And then there's a break where you're going to see me leave for a few minutes, and then I come back later. Um, so, so I do come back, and then I come back on my phone, and I'm walking outside because I can't get it to connect well inside. And then the mosquitoes are chasing me. Anyway, it's fun. But um, <laughs> despite all that, it was, it was great to uh, speak with him, and Brad Sab was on there too. So that's the backstory of some of the issues that we had. I think the conversation was pretty good. And I'll just go ahead and this this is uh, got all all Leighton Flower Soteriology 101 um, logos and stuff all over because it, it was recorded for his channel. So I took, um, I combined in stuff that I recorded plus what was on his channel and combined all that together to, to try to put this together and offer a little bit higher quality than what was online. So... Um, Without further ado, as James White would say, let's get to it. Hello and welcome to Sociology 101. The moment you've all been waiting for, many of you have asked this for a number of months and maybe even years now. Uh, for me to have our friend from Beyond the Fundamentals, uh, Kevin Thompson, on with us. And lo and behold, there he is, standing on the... He walks on water, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, what else do you Just want? Just floating on water. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, Leighton? It's, it's great to be here. Well, thank you for coming on. We're having some technical difficulties, as you can tell. The reason we're starting a little bit late is because there's a little lag in the uh, the system somewhere. We've tried re-logging on two or three times and reconnecting. That's just the nature of doing uh, live broadcasting. And uh, uh, the internet sometimes participates and sometimes it doesn't participate by decree, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, so, Ke Kevin, uh, uh, viewers... Um, or we can even reschedule and do another time if it ends up yeah, being too much of a, of a problem. My, now my recording's messing up, but we're going we're going to go anyway. We'll be all right. We'll just keep we'll we'll press forward and um, tell tell us a little bit first of all. Uh, tell us a little bit about beyond the fundamentals. Uh, maybe what your story? How did you get it started? Uh, just tell us a little about yourself for the those that are just tuning in and learning more about you. So um, I've been saved. I was saved at a small, at a small, at a young age. I was not small, actually, but um, I've always, I've always had a burden or a calling. Probably since about the age that I, of sixteen, I've had a burden or a calling to go into the ministry. And as I was in the military, I was actually trying to go in as a chaplain, and that didn't work out because as soon as I got my four-year degree in two thousand three. Um, I got called active duty to go to Iraq, and I was already a qualified signal officer. So it took me off the chaplaincy path, but I already had my degree in theology. So I just, and I and I'm a, I was a qualified signal officer. So I worked in communications, computers, radios, telephones, that kind of thing, um, in my career, and I stayed active from then until I was medically retired in 2015. All throughout the military, I was you know helping out different churches. I would join. Um, churches and help out with the music or with teaching Sunday school. I've uh, been an interim pastor several times. I've been a pastor a couple of times. 
um, doing whatever I could. As I would encounter chaplains, they would often tell me, hey, we've listened to some of your Bible studies and we think that you're kind of going too deep for some people. You know, people, if people want that, they'll go to seminary. You should just, you know, stick to the fundamentals, stick to the basics. And, <laughs> and so my complaint was always, well, if, if you can't go deep at church, where can you? You know, where, where can that be done? I, I think you should be able to find whatever you can at church. And so it's kind of a, I think you should be able to go beyond the fundamentals. So my goal has always been just to try to find some kind of venue. It, it, it's always been person face to face, but to try to find some kind of place to interact with people where we learn Bible together and, and take it as far as we can and grow as much as we can to find out what the potentiality in the word of God is and, and take it to its full extent. Um, and so that's where the name beyond the fundamentals comes from. And the whole idea of dealing with Calvinism is, wasn't really, wasn't really on my radar screen. I, I just really wanted to go as far, you know, to, to get as much growth and maturity as was possible. And I kept finding, even in my own life, that this hurdle of Calvinism was something that a lot of people are going to have to get past before they can do any growth beyond that. It's almost like a tripwire at the starting line of a race. And uh, you kind of have to make people, <laughs> make sure people are looking out for that uh, before you can go on uh, and keep running the race. And I, my real interest is just to run the race, but that issue seems to be in the way. So I started dealing with it a little bit and then it seems like it just has grown. <laughs> it's become this thing where we deal with Calvinism on a regular basis. Well, uh, you, uh, you are coming across a little robotic um, from what I'm getting here, feedback from the from the uh, people who are watching. Um, and I hate for them to miss uh, the stuff you're saying because you, you say some really good stuff. Uh, and so um, I wanted to address, while I had you on here, sometimes uh, the, the biggest question question that people bring up with regard to both of our work that we do online is one, why do you address Calvinism so much? And two, Leighton, why are you so nice? And Kevin, why are you so mean? There you go. Um, that, that usually good is kind of com comes across as <laughs> yeah, good cop, bad cop. <laughs> Somebody actually made that comment. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I've always, you know, I was a Calvinist. I, 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 were you ever a Calvinist? I can't remember. Uh, for about a year. When I, yeah, after my first year at the University of Mobile, where I was majoring in theology, uh, which was my junior okay. year of college. But yeah, for about a year. Yeah, um, it, and yeah. I was I was a Calvinist for a good ten years of my life, and so maybe there's Just a like August, there's some of that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh, well, he was a Manichaean for for ten what's, years. What's the difference? Um, uh, See, you're already starting. You're already <laughs> starting. Um, and and um, I, I think having been a Calvinist for so long, there may be there may be a um, something built in there to go. Okay, I remember how I thought when I was a Calvinist, and I, I didn't I didn't really put those two things together. And so there's a there's a I guess there's maybe built within me some some level of. Uh, I don't know, forgiveness level or a kind of a, I get where you're coming from kind of a level of, yeah. I understand why you think that. Um, and, and therefore I don't uh, treat them as, uh, as, as, uh, like outside the camp, so to speak, as some people do. Um, but at the same time, I, I understand why people are get vehemently upset with a Calvinist because they have their church split over the issue, for example, they have um, a child or a daughter uh, who who become Calvinistic and yep. um, maybe even a cage stage kind of Calvinist and split their family or split yep. their home church like I did when I was a young Calvinist. Well, that's or usually they even, when people uh, find you and me. Something like that. Yeah, happens. that's yeah. We're and so a lot of the people who end up on the salience landscape until something like that happens. Exactly. And then, so they're coming, looking for an answer. They're upset because some young Calvinist pastor just took over their church that mm -hmm. they'd been a part of for 40, 50, 60 years. And all of a sudden they don't belong there anymore. They don't fit there anymore. Right. Um, they either that, they see one of their own children become a, a Calvinist and possibly even leave the faith because of one's holding to Calvinism as mm -hmm. is the testimony of a couple I'm dealing with right now. 
Um, and so I can understand how that anger and, and deep resentment really does build up pretty quickly. And I can understand how someone would be really drawn uh, to, to kind of a, a more like a in your face kind of approach to uh, confronting the issue. So I get it. And there's times in which I, I feel a little bit more in your face about it than others. But, um, but I, I guess, I guess for the listeners, maybe give a little bit explanation as to why you approach Calvinism the way you do. And then I can give a little bit more explanation. I think most of my listeners know why I approach it the way I do, but maybe give uh, the listeners a, a, maybe a background. Why do you approach it? You're a military guy. Um, military guys are known to be a little bit more uh, tough, I guess it is, uh, you could say. Yeah. Uh, maybe I, help people understand why is it that you kind of take that approach, the in-your-face kind of approach. So if I have an in-your-face kind of approach, I'll say that it's probably... Uh, I don't know how deliberate that is. I don't know how... It's not like I sit down and plan to be that way. It could just be that that's what comes out. Um, so I, I don't like strategize... You know, I'm going to, I'm going to put this one on, I'm going to crank this one up to eight. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't really work that way. Um, so the goal of what I'm trying to do is trying to be more of a, and I, I don't really know how many ideologues I'm going to reach with what I'm saying, but what I'm trying to do is be a prophylactic, if you will, against other people turning to Calvinism to try to equip them to not fall prey to it at least the way that I did. Cause I remember, I remember at the end of when I stopped being a Calvinist, it had something to do with having my eyes opened very clearly about what scripture said about predestination in Ephesians one, that I just don't know why that did not occur to me before. It was so obvious once I saw it. And my biggest thought was how, how can I get other people to see this before they have to become a Calvinist? Because most people, once they go down that road, it, I mean, statistically, they don't come back. So how can we prevent that from happening? And as I started to study the issue, I, I first of all realized that I had a very difficult time articulating what it is I was trying to say. And I wanted to actually offer something of substance and not just emote. Like, that's not fair, you know, I don't want to be that kind of person. And so, I, and as I'm attempting to carefully craft an articulated message, I'm noticing two things that what I'm seeing in scripture is not the same thing that other non-Calvinists are refuting Calvinism with. And so I wanted to differentiate myself from the other non-Calvinists, call them Arminians, call them whatever, but, but there's a lot of views they hold that I just, I wasn't seeing that in scripture, but it's, I, would, I would present this carefully crafted message, but then a Calvinist responding to me would respond not to me, but to Arminianism. And so that's kind of frustrating. I'm like, hey, I, I did not cook up an Arminianist message for you to respond to. I actually thought and presented and saw and shared something else with you, but you didn't even listen to it. So that's a little bit frustrating. And there's, there's, another, as, there's another aspect where maybe it's because I'm military. Maybe it's because I was in more of a, <laughs> I was in more of a militant background fundamentalist kind of church growing up where a lot of things were in your face and that's what I'm used to but also in the military background constantly dealing with people from a lot of different denominations and we're talking about special forces guys infantry men uh, just people who have been to battle medics who watch their buddies die and there is an element of speaking very plain and straight street language that cuts to the chase that that people who I guess people who get their hands dirty with day-to-day -day work you know mechanics and painters and stuff like that construction workers pe people like that tend to tend to respond when you're more concrete and cut right to the chase even if you have to uh even if language is a little colorful and I don't, I don't mean like profanity colorful but maybe attention grabbing um yeah <laughs> So yeah, and I, and I share, I, I share yeah. some of the same frustrations. Um, you and I talked beforehand and found out that you and I hold to a lot of the same perspectives with yes. regard to rejecting 
the concept of total inability and the the Armenian need for a yes. provenient work of grace to make Absolutely. people able to to make choices again. And we both reject the concept or idea that you can lose your salvation or that you can be born again and then uh, and then not born again uh, somehow. Uh, right. So we, we hold to exactly the same kind of systematic approach, it sounds like, from our conversations. And it, it does get frustrating when you're uh, dealing with a, a Calvinist and they automatically just assume you're a foresight faith Arminian um, and they don't really deal with uh, your actual perspective. And I'm sure Calvinists can feel the same frustration when they are a three point, three and a half point or whatever it is, a modified form of Calvinism they are. And the non-Calvinist is confronting them, and they're not really addressing their specific type of Calvinism. Right, right. Um, so I guess that can go both ways. Um, I, I, I'm still getting comments that you're coming through kind of grainy and real uh, difficult, kind of uh, auto-tuned. Some of them say, uh, some of them suggest maybe turning off um, background or even your um, your your audio, your video, maybe helping with bandwidth. Uh, you can try that if you'd like to. And and while while you do that, um, I want to bring in a um, I can why, stop while you the do cam. that, yeah, I, I guess try that and see um, audio wise if that may be a little stronger. I don't, yeah, I don't um, know if people on there heard, but we have tried. Uh, we, yeah, we've we tried, tried all that beforehand. Two different yeah, internet, three different devices. Um, background, no background. Playing camera, different cameras. We tried. We tried a few things. I'm going to turn my camera off. Let's see. Let's see if that helps any. Um, can you still hear us? All right. I can still hear you. Yeah, it's, it's the same. I mean, the voice is still doing the, the auto tune kind of sound, still, but still robotic, huh? Yeah. That's well, so um, yeah, I know. Um, and we may just need to reschedule, do another, another, uh, another episode whenever we can talk more fully. Cause I don't want people to, to miss what you're saying. Um, but while you're here, I want you to hear uh, a testimony from somebody. I think you've probably heard his testimony before because he's been on the program uh, probably a couple of years ago. Um, in fact, let me put him in the, the show here. Uh, this is Brad Saab. Brad is a former Calvinist, um, and your mic is muted there, Brad. So uh, I wanted you to give your testimony because... Some may prefer my style and my way of <laughs> approaching these doctrines, um, and and rightly so. I, I'm I'm the best. I'm the best. I'm the best approach. Obviously, I mean, let's just let's just say the way it is. <laughs> so, but I but obviously, my way doesn't work on some people. Brad would have laughed at me and called me a flower patch kid or something like that. And uh, but Kevin um, is obviously someone who is able to at least have some influence on uh, on brad here as a former calvinist and so i asked brad and i did kevin kevin didn't even know i was going to do this this is a surprise to kevin and kevin might as well show your camera because i don't think it, it matters uh as far as the bandwidth at least we can see your face there you go yeah um so brad brad while you're here share share your story and uh, let people hear a little bit more about you and about how kevin uh ministered to you in your time of change and <laughs> deconversion <laughs> sure, absolutely. And uh, what's going on there to both of you? Hope you're both doing well. That's yeah, good and, to meet you. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, so, yeah, so I had uh, I had been in ministry and had been largely in a lot of kind of seeker driven, seeker sensitive type ministries, and that was vocationally uh, as well as voluntarily. And so, what kind of I was a I, I became a, a Driscoll Calvinist, right? A more yeah. Driscoll Calvinist, and that was because you know I was in these seeker driven type uh churches and then all of a sudden this driscoll guy comes along and he's actually preaching the bible and i'm like you can't say that kind of thing <laughs> like because you're actually saying what the bible says and you're not supposed to do that because that runs people off you know it's very uh kind of free will evangelism type of thing like man if i say the wrong thing then this person's never gonna hear the gospel they're gonna run away from the church whatever and uh and then because of him i got introduced to uh, Matt Chandler, early Matt Chandler, which I think he would now critique pretty, pretty rigorously was early Matt Chandler years. But all these guys are very rough and tumble. They're very rigorous kind of guys. And I'm like, these are like men, right? Like these guys are saying stuff and Driscoll <laughs> screaming at people. And I'm like, this is awesome. This is like my brand of Christianity. And uh, so come to find out I had, uh, you know, I start tying all these guys together that I'm reading. I started reading through to them and and Piper and I'm like, well, this is my camp. And the common thread was obviously their predestinarian view. And uh, so I ended up preaching through John six. I preached the gospel of John with my youth group. I hit John six and I'm like, 
I'm Calvinist. Here we are. So there's no way I can deny this. And uh, and I was not a uh, I was not a nice John Piper Calvinist. You know, I was uh, John Piper's just so soft and kind and pastoral and he yeah. does that. I was I was very Driscoll esque and had become a lead pastor uh, of a church. And when I got there, I, I tried to tell them like they're Southern Baptist Church. They're they're kind of just free will background kind of thing and i was telling him i was like listen here's who i am here's my deal and i'm using all the language and there was one guy who was interviewing me and he knew he's like who who do you read who are your favorite authors and i'm listing all my favorite you know reformed baptistic calvinistic authors but anyway i got in and i tried to tell him it wasn't sneaky i wasn't being sneaky but right. they didn't know and uh anyway it started causing trouble with the church started being pretty contentious and i could have been much more a peacemaker but that was very influenced by my thinking of it doesn't matter what I say, you know, it doesn't matter how I say it or what I say. I'm going to declare the gospel and then let the gospel do its work. It's just kind of a, you know, and again, this is not to paint all of my predestinarian brothers, my reformed or Calvinistic brothers, whatever label you want to use for yourself in that light. It was mm-hmm. me. That's how it affected me, because I was affected by the the rough and tumble Driscoll version. So anyway, I ended up stepping out of that that church. I'd caused some people some trouble, and just for a number of reasons, I stepped out. I went into the penalty box for two years, and when I was in the penalty box for two years, um, I kind of went before God, and I was like, God, uh, I don't even know if I want to go back into vocational ministry, but if I do, everything's on the table, just whatever. Like, I don't care. You bring it. You, you're sovereign, and so you go. Like, do your thing. And I got a, uh, I got a text message, no, a, uh, a Facebook message, from a missionary from that church who had gone over to Japan and he was an opponent, right? So he's, he was not in my camp. And Kevin, he sent me your video uh, of the Ephesians one. And so I think, yeah. I think it's interesting that you, that you said that that was where you started. Cause it was like, it's so clear, yeah, right? Yeah. It's predestined, right? It says it is blatantly like you're predestined to adoption. Right. And so, <laughs> so he shows, so, so he showed me Kevin's video and I watched that and, like it was, it was like a nine o'clock at night kind of thing. And I watched the video and I'm like, you know, kind of got this weird look on my face. And my wife is like, what are you watching? And I'm like, I'm not sure, but, <laughs> but he's using the, he's not Calvinist, but he's still using the Bible. And because, you know, non-Calvinists <laughs> don't use Bibles and yeah. he's, and he's, and he's <laughs> rough and tumble. And I was like, this is my love. Like, it's like punch you in the face, which is my love language, right? It's my, it's the sixth love language. <laughs> and so it, that video was the one that opened the door because, you know, the big thing with, with reform theology, one of the big things is sola scriptura, right? right? And Kevin comes along and he's using scripture to interpret scripture, right? So we're in Ephesians one and Kevin in that video, you go over to, uh, Romans eight twenty nine uh, and and thirty and oh you know it was it was it wasn't just the predestined part it was the adoption part that's what yep, it was I, yep. I've got it it was a couple of years ago now um, but you were talking about being predestined to adoption and I was like hang on a second because in my reform brain right I'm I love Wayne Grudem and Wayne Grudem lays out ordo salutis I got Wayne okay? Grudem's book right over there yeah yeah and so Kevin so in your video. Like you're you're talking about being predestined to adoption and my brain's going, well, that's not predestined to conversion. That's not predestined to regeneration. That's not predestined right. to repentance. That's predestined to adoption. Right. And so I'm having a crisis. And uh, at the time we were in Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm like, this is not good. Right. And <laughs> like because because it started creating a problem. And so anyway, so that opened the door, the tone of it, which is what we're talking about right now. Your tone kind of I mean, you weren't. Uh, as exuberant as a, as a Mark Driscoll, but it was still, <laughs> it was still firm. So I have room for improvements. Was... That's right. Yeah. You, you can still grow there, <laughs> you know? And so it was the, it was the assertiveness because there's a lot of the, a lot of what I had dealt with pre before that video with, with people in the church where I had been serving as a lead pastor, um, was I could never believe in a God and there was tears and there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I'm like, get out of here. I yeah. don't need any of that. Like, I'm not interested <laughs> in your crying. And so Kevin, you come in and it was, it was, we're interpret we're using scripture to interpret scripture, right? We're sola scriptura. And, mm-hmm. and that's, 
you know, that's my that's my other love language is solo scriptura. And it was it was <laughs> manly. It was, yeah. And so so that's why it connected. And so then I started reading widely about that. So anyway, so yeah. Did I did I cover that for you, Layton? Yeah, absolutely. I, I wanted y'all to hear because Brad in our former interview really kind of helped me to see from my perspective how sometimes um, people connect with different personalities in different ways. Um, and, and God's going to gift people with different skill sets and different approaches. Um, now, I, I still maintain and I still believe and I still will will um, will encourage people to approach uh, others with with love and kindness. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't mean being namby pamby. Um, that doesn't mean you have to pussyfoot, as we're about to hear uh, R.C. Sproul say. R.C. Sproul, um, yeah. R.C. Sproul, <laughs> yeah. Th th this video clip was sent to me. This is what inspired this this uh, meeting of the minds here, um, for me at least, was when I heard R.C. Sproul, who is probably close to my age when he made this video. His hairstyle is, is beautiful, by the way, that you're about to see. Um, <laughs> and so... Let's let's take this um, two minutes, a two minute, two minute and 50 second clip um, of Arshish Brol deciding where he's going to take Lincoln Air Ministries when they decide, you know what, we're going to start majoring on Calvinism. In other words, we're, we've been talking about all this stuff, other stuff, but we're really going to stop pussyfooting around is the way he put it. And we're going to start really majoring on what matters. Um, and, I, I, and I think this kind of plays into what we're talking about here uh, with regard to these doctrines because it really does help us to see if on the Calvinist side, they, they kind of went through this metamorphosis themselves in some way uh, to trying to try, trying to be more straightforward and more like in your face, mm -hmm. this is what we believe. And this is why we believe it. And this is something that we're going to hold firm. Um, and, and one of the, the critiques I have for many who are on my side of the fence, so to speak, uh, the non Calvinistic side of the fence is is that they treat this like it's not that important of a doctrine. Now you can say what you want to about me. Yes, I, I'm a nice guy, but you can't say that I'm not quiet. You can't say that I'm quiet about this issue, right, uh, or right. you can't say that I, I don't care about this issue. Obviously I do. Um, and my critique that I have for my, my non Calvinist buddies in the Southern Baptist convention, as well as abroad, my Arminian friends is that many of you treat this like it's how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it's so much more important than that. It's, it, it, it gets to the very heart of the character of God. It gets to the methodology of our apologetics and evangelism. It gets to the motivation for why we do what we do uh, in the church. It gets to the integrity. I think of God who calls us to repentance and faith. Do we really, do we really believe that he wants us to repent and believe when he calls us to, all of these are, are at stake, I think, when it comes to these doctrines. That doesn't mean I, I don't think we can treat those who disagree with us with respect. I think we can treat them with respect. But at the same time, I do think we have to start being more firm and addressing these things instead of just putting it on the back burner and saying, let's not be divisive. Let's, For the sake of unity, let's just not talk about our differences. Right. Um, my wife has taught me in, in marriage counseling that that's the worst thing you can do <laughs> In, in a relationship is just to bury your feelings for the sake of unity because you end up just uh, exploding because you're not learning to, to talk through those issues and to work them out. And, and, I, and I think there's a, a place for us addressing those things. Um, and I think that's so valuable for us to remember as, as we're addressing this even now and, and encouraging, hopefully, uh, those who watch this uh, to, to be willing to step up and say, we, we do hold firmly to God's love and provision for all people. We do hold firmly and speak boldly about our belief with regard to the doctrines of God's grace. And no, that's the doctrines of God's grace are not uniquely Calvinistic. Predestination is not uniquely Calvinistic. Uh, election is not uniquely Calvinistic. And we've got to begin, I think, to claim those words and, and say we hold yeah. to strong biblical doctrines with regard to predestination and election and all the things surrounding this. And um, we don't have to pussyfoot around about that, uh, so to speak. So with that introduction, let's watch this video together. We said for 20 years, this ministry has focused our teaching outreach on addressing the Catholic questions of Christianity, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of the authority of Scripture, the person and work of Christ, 
being careful not to give too much emphasis to the distinctives of the theology that I personally embrace, the Reformed faith. Because we wanted to minister to the broad evangelical audience. Because we understand that the church is being torn apart in this day, not be over issues of predestination or not, but over issues of whether or not God exists, or whether or not Christ is divine, or if the Bible is the Word of God. Those have been the, uh, the, the central issues, and these issues touch every Christian, not just those who are in this small minority group called uh, Reformed people. But at this meeting I said, look, We've done that. We've produced the materials. Now it's time to go into phase two. And the board says, what do you mean by phase two? I said, I'm tired of pussyfooting. Because I don't think we're ever going to see a healthy evangelical church until the evangelical church is reformed, solidly reformed, where it takes seriously biblical Christianity and its concept of a sovereign God. Because unreformed Christianity has failed in our culture. It has been pervasively antinomian. It has been pervasively uh, uh, liberal in its trends and tendencies away from Scripture because there's not a basal commitment to the sovereignty of God. And so I'm not going to play around anymore. When people tell me, you know, that they don't believe in predestination, I'm going to grab them by the throat and say, why not? The Bible teaches it! Say, enough of your humanistic clinging to uh, uh, your concept of free will that's as foreign from the biblical doctrine of the bondage of sin in the heart that you can find. Never mind that the majority report of evangelicals is Arminian. I'm not. And I think Arminianism is death to Christianity in the final analysis. At the heart of Reformed theology, at the heart of Luther's struggle, at the heart of Calvin's awakening, at the heart of Knox, at the heart of Edwards, were, were men who were awakened to the greatness, to the majesty, to the holiness, to the sovereignty of God. And finally, by contemplating the holiness of God and the sovereignty of God, they were driven to develop their doctrines of the grace of God. All right. Kevin, what do you think about that video? Well, in case you can't hear me, um, I actually wrote up some comments about it and posted it. It's the first thing on my homepage at beyondthefundamentals.com in case somebody wants to read that. But I, I see all kinds of things that he says in that video, which are, um, there's a lot of double speak in there, for example. Um, first of all, to, to not pussyfoot around, I think is the right answer. If that's what you believe, then come out and say it. You know, don't 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 hide it. Um, he talks about biblical Christianity. Well, biblical Christianity didn't know anything of Calvinism. There was no Calvinism in biblical Christianity. And what what stood out to me probably the most the first time that I saw it, and he says a concept of a sovereign God, and what Calvinists do is they, they take issues other than scriptural authority and they slip them in as the new authority without telling you, if you will. Um, I don't know if you can see this on my screen right now, but I have this little circle here, sovereignty, omnipotence, omniscience, immutability, man's sinfulness, grace, election, predestination, and then back around to sovereignty. And what the the cup game is, or the hidden P game is, is that if, if you properly elevate, if you have the right attitude toward those things, that can substitute as a metric of authenticity as opposed to Scripture. So having the correct view of the sovereignty of God was the metric of authenticity over and above scriptural, scriptural authority. But he doesn't come out and say that. And so then he goes on to complain about antinomianism and liberalism. So many non-Calvinist traditions are not antinomian, but that's also a trick because antinomianism is not a metric of truth. But when he words it that way, it, it tricks the mind to kind of make you think that it is, if you will. 
Um, like liberalism too. Many non-Calvinist traditions are not liberal. And Calvinism is not the only means of avoiding liberalism or antinomianism. But he frames the issues as if, as if Calvinism is the only answer to avoid those errors. So they're pretty good at putting up um, errors like you don't want to be a liberal or an antinomian in this case or a Pelagian or an Arminian, whatever, whatever the boogeyman of the week is. And the implication is that being a Calvinist is the only way to avoid that. And then other things are listed seems, up such it seems as... To me the only, it seems to me the only way to avoid it is if God decrees for you to avoid it, regardless of what <laughs> theological, regardless right. of what theological view yeah, you have. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that would be the case. And then, and then well, they I, lift I, up I these other to... things as, you know, when he promotes the sovereignty of God, it's, you know, sovereignty does not appear. That's something I always tell people is that, you know, the King James Bible was commissioned by a Scottish Presbyterian Calvinist. It says free will 17 times. It says predestination four times. It says sovereignty zero times. <laughs> and so why would you have this big, huge focus on a word that does not appear in Scripture? Um, and it tells you the reason is because Scripture is not the authority. That's, that's the reason. And every, so every time a Calvinist either emphasizes God or diminishes man, because we know those things are good. We know man's supposed to be humble. We know man, we know that God is in control and we should exalt, glorify, and elevate him. But they slip those things in that if you do it more than the other guy, then you're right and they're wrong. And what they're not telling you when they play that little shuffle game is that they're exchanging that out for scriptural authority. Yeah, and you do a video, you did a video, um, I've watched several of your videos over the years, and one of my favorite videos that you did was relating the approach that Calvinists bring uh, that's similar to what we see within the political realm uh, with liberalism, uh, oh, with yeah. kind of the it's liberal, liberal one, ways. Yeah, it's not a real long video, but um, because I had thought some of the same things, like for example, when you use the word progressive, instead of the word liberal it used to use the word liberal was used uh you know uh, pretty regularly back in the day but yeah. but the word liberal became uh, a bad word um kind of like the word calvinism in a lot of circles became a bad word uh and, and predestination even became kind of a kind of a catch word and so the the tendency is to shift the language to say instead of instead of liberal we'll say progressive well instead of calvinism we'll say doctrines of grace Yep, or we'll yep, say reform, exactly right. reform, you know, reform theology, or something like that. Uh, and again, I don't think it's like intentionally being subversive on the part of the masses. I don't think that any particular Calvinist, some of my friends are out there going, "Hey, let's change this so as to trick people." I think it's just a it's a natural shift that kind of begins to take place when you begin to try to talk to somebody and you you use the word Calvinism a few times and you see them recoil. And you hear them yeah. talk about how bad Calvinism is. And then all of a sudden you go, well, next time I talk to somebody, I'm just not going to use that word next time. Well, it's, because it's rebranding it, it, to make things more palatable. You know, right. it happens all the time. <laughs> and it can happen on both sides, too. Right. I mean, obviously, if if, if uh, we don't like a particular phrase that doesn't come across well, it's not communicating well, we, we could change it, too. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not trying to say that that's, a, that's, that's necessarily unique to Calvinism, but the reason that it has to be pointed out is because sometimes what happens is, especially when it comes to church hiring issues, um, a church is trying to bring in a pastor and they're using vernacular and language that's very similar to your own, same vocabulary, different dictionary as we've talked yeah, about yeah. before. And then all of a sudden you hire a young Calvinistic pastor who doesn't call himself Calvinistic, right? Um, but Calvin he's like a, a young, you know, you know, young Leighton Flowers or Brad Saab, and and they all of a sudden come into this church teaching "quote unquote" tulip for the very first time in his church's history, and before you for, before you know it, there's you know there's infighting and there's and there's bickering and there's mm -hmm. uh, okay how how do we how do we square the circle of you talking about certain individuals being predestined before they're ever born? Uh, but we've always believed that whosoever will can believe kind of doctrine. Um, and then all of a sudden the church is is faced with splitting. And uh, that's happening 
I'm in denominational work, so I, I actually hear behind the scenes stories quite well, a bit. When it goes that's up for debate, the Calvinist is prepared for the debate, and most of the people usually aren't. It, exactly right. Yes, um, most Calvinists know why they're Calvinist, whereas most non-Calvinists have no clue right. on the subject. And and even when they're when the attention is brought to it, the, then and this is what's so aggravating to me about the leading voices within our denomination and in our Christian world is when you bring this up, they say, Oh, well, let's just not talk about that. Let's just, let's just put that. Oh, that's a fun discussion. Leighton. I'm glad you're, you know, doing what you're doing, but let's talk about evangelism. Yeah, let's yeah. talk about winning the loss. Let's talk about why, why are you, why are you wasting time on that? And I'm, I'm going, guys, I'm a director of evangelism. I, I spend my life doing evangelism. I'm not trying I think, but we, I think we can, walk and chew gum at the same time. Right, I think right. it's possible for me to stop watching so much sports center. Um, and and that, that steps on a lot of their toes because I, I happen to know a lot of them <laughs> do watch a lot of sports center. Um, and I think we can take some time to address this issue within our convention. Um, yeah. Can't, can't, can't we have a discussion about this, this, the work of God in sh bringing salvation to the world? I mean, don't you think that's an important enough topic for us to actually spend some time uncovering and talking about? I think it's important. Well, I think if if I can say something, I think it hits right to the key. Um, I'm all if if something can be non-essential and you get along, I'm all for that. And one of the problems I have with Calvinism is on how it affects evangelism. And I'm not talking about Calvinists not evangelizing because God's going to save whoever He wants. What really stood out to me when dealing with Calvinism is that. It, it gets right to the heart of the gospel. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He's yeah, we, we lost you, Kevin. I, I still have you guys. Uh, okay, yeah, your your audio is just really, really difficult. I hate this so bad because you're, yeah. you're saying so many great things, and I'm wanting everybody to hear it, and they're, and they're only hearing a third, I think, of what everything you're saying. Um, That's horrible. I mean, um, let's, yeah, let's plan to do this again. And, and maybe we'll just have you back on to talk through some of these things, because a lot of what you're saying is, is really valuable and I don't want um, my listeners to miss it. Um, but I, I guess while we have Brad here too, let me, let me bring him into this portion of the discussion too. Brad, since you're coming out of Calvinism, what has, I mean, in, in your, in your estimation, what has been, I, I guess, what has been your experience since even our last interview is, is this a, a topic that's worth discussing? Um, and, and why is it worth discussing? Is it something that we should, would, should put back on the back burner or is it maybe we're bringing too much attention to it? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think it's worth discussing. I think it's worth talking about. I like what Kevin says, like, if you can get along, like I have good friends that are reformed here in the city. Like we came, we planted a church and, um, I'm, I'm not coming from a predestinarian. That's my word, by the way, is predestinarian. Cause it's like, I'm not Calvinist. Okay. Like, are, are you predestinarian in your soter soteriology? I don't care what label you want reformed or Calvinist. Like, right. Does regeneration precede conversion? Yes or no. Like that's our conversation. Right. But I have friends who are reformed and, good friends and we work together and we do stuff together. We get along great, but um, they come from that kind of, I, I loved what Matt Chandler, when I was, when I was in the reformed camp, I love what Matt Chandler said about the idea of God saying to, I forgot what city he was in. I think it was Paul talking and saying, stay in Ephesus. Uh, I have many people in this city. Right. And so we go and we boldly declare the gospel. So if that's you and you're, that's your camp as, as a Calvinist or reformed or predestinarian, um, then bravo, man, rock and roll. Um, I can tell you for me, what took me into it was a lot of what R.C. Sproul was saying in that video, right? Which is the, the, the antinomianism, the liberalism, the silliness of what kind of cute tricks are we going to try to um, reach people with the gospel? And what Calvinism did for me was it made it so that I could say the gospel and, and speak truth and speak on hell and speak on sin and speak on the law as its role of convicting people to sin and say those things. Now, since coming out of it, um, I've kept so much of that, that boldness because now it's not, it's not an issue of predestination or not. It's an issue of, do I think I'm smarter than God or not? 
right? And so I'm going to have this conversation about my evangelism. Um, you know, it's it, it's very clear. You, you've got an Ezekiel watchman on the wall kind of thing. Like you've got to talk about the law of God, and the holiness of God, the transgression, and here's what judgment looks like. And, and you've got to say those things, even though I'm no longer pre- predestinarian. I'll still preach right through those things and, and not be antinomian, not be liberal on the authority of Scripture or any, any other facet, actually. Um, but I think it's a worthwhile conversation. And I'll, if for nothing else, I, I think it, it's really interesting. And you just, you just hit on something just like, oh, it's a major burr in my saddle right now. And that's the amount of dudes that are sitting around watching TV and, and girls, right, just watching ESPN. Right. And you can take mm-hmm. something like Calvinism, predestination, free will, whatever, just like you can take end times and you can use that and introduce the controversy. So maybe they will turn off the TV and actually engage in doctrinal things. Like I was trained to think exegetically and doctrinally because of the conversation of predestination versus free will. I was taught. Yeah sola scriptura because of the issue that you're that you're talking about right and so you can go yeah it's like it's like this doctrine is what kind of is what spurred me to start driving deeper into other theological issues because it's it's like it for me whenever john MacArthur was what introduced me i read the book ashamed of the gospel where Ashamed of the Gospel, that book, if you haven't read it, it it's one of those books that's really just atta- attacking pragmatism. This seeker-sensitive sure. kind of thing of, hey, whatever works must be good. If it builds the church, if it makes the church bigger, and, uh, in other words, if there's more numbers, it must be right. It must be good. It doesn't matter what uh, kind of shenanigans you're putting on. Uh, it, it, as long as it's getting uh, butts in the pew, I mean, you are you're you must be doing right. And, and, and MacArthur kind of like you, I was attracted to this too. He just, he just blasts this and just says, why are we so concerned about what the seeker thinks? Why aren't we more concerned about what God thinks? And I was just like, I was just like drawn to this because I was so surrounded by more of an entertainment focus kind of approach to church. And all of a sudden you've got this really strong exegetical pastor coming on and just spanking uh, all these lead pastors around the world going, guys, the, the Bible is our authority. The gospel is the power of God into salvation. Preach the gospel. And then he tags in Calvinism with that. And so I attach Calvinism to exegesis. I attach Calvinism to deep theological thinking. Um, And so everything I knew about deep, robust theology was attached to Tulip in some way. And I think just like you, it was it was through Tulip that I was taught systematic theology in, in general. Um, and then, and that, that's kind of what led to my being a theology geek, uh, and instead of sitting around watching sports center all the time, even when I do watch occasional football game, usually Dallas Cowboys, I, you can ask my wife, I usually have a commentary <laughs> open <laughs> reading it during, during between plays, because I, 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 I'm just a theology geek. I just enjoy theology. And that started really with my introduction to Calvinism when I was 19 years old. Uh, it sure. sounds like you kind of had the same kind of experience. Yeah, it was very much that same type of connection. It was, you know, I'm, you know, and I, it, you know, it's funny, you and I did the first interview and then my mentor called me like two days later. He's like, I didn't know you thought so poorly of secrets driven or thought I was secret driven and secrets. And so we were having a conversation because he would, he was, he was great. And I was like, I'm not talking about you, right. It's talking about other, other aspects, but it's, it's interesting that it was, Driscoll doing theology. It was Matt Chandler preaching exegetically. It was, it was Piper, like God is most glorified us when we're most satisfied in him. And I'm like, what is going on? Right. And it's a super intellectual thing. Like I heard Piper speak at passion 2000 in Memphis, this huge college kid thing um, in Memphis. And I remember coming out of that, I'm a 19 year old and I think I'm smart. I'm at the university of Florida and I'm there on scholarship and I'm black thinker. Right. And he preaches and I'm like, I don't know what that dude just said. But that was the smartest thing I've ever heard. And so it was like to, to be intellectual for me, it, it was it was wrong headed, but it was to be intellectual for me to be um, rigorous and, and love doctrine and exegesis. You have to be Calvinist like that was my right. tie. It was like, yeah, it was like it was it, you, you couldn't you can't have one without the other. It's like what Kevin was saying earlier, which where he's trying to get back on here and we're going to try to see if we can connect with him. 
Um, and that's and that's exactly what he was saying. It was almost like if if somebody's smart and and uh, intellectual, it's like you just had this assumption that well, that they must be a Calvinist then. And, and Calvinists even treat other intellectual smart guys as if they're one of their camp. Like you'll you'll hear for the for years, I thought A. W. Tozer and C. S. Lewis, for example, were Calvinists the way Piper talked about them. And it was almost like they just kind of adopted them into their camp because they're exegetical, they're uh, smart, they're intelligent, they talk a lot about the Bible, so they must be a part of the camp. But of course, only when you really read deep enough into their studies, you recognize they weren't a part of the, that camp um, at all. And 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 in fact, most of Christian history, some of the deepest thinking Christian scholars were not Calvinistic, um, did not hold to the five point system. Um, and that's a shock to, to the system of a lot of young Calvinists, at least, because I think in our culture right now, it, it's painted like uh, Calvinism owns the it kind of the own is the corner owns the corner of, of exegesis and deep theological thinking. Uh, Kevin, uh, is uh, you still look a little draggy, but maybe your your voice is coming through your. Uh, yeah, can, I, I see you're in your backyard now. Yeah. Can you hear me now? I'm just trying to use I can't, the cellular Internet. I can hear you, so um, we'll we'll just stick with this for now. If that if that keeps working, we'll just try it. <laughs> so it. Uh, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, feel free to continue where you left off. I think you were talking a little bit more about Sproul's video and just talking about how liberalism isn't necessarily going to be combated because you're a Calvinist. Matter of fact, we see a lot of liberalism within uh, the Reformed or Calvinistic tradition. Um, do you want to you want to continue to highlight that point a little bit further? Yeah, sure. Um, Calvinists like to li they like to list positive things as if um, as if those positive things are the metrics of, of authenticity. And since they champion them, then that means you're correct. You have to go there to have the correct view of the sovereignty of God. And then they list bad things as if going into Calvinism is the only way to avoid them. And when they are listing positive and negative attributes, the shell game that they're playing is that they are diverting your attention away from the authority of Scripture. They are using those things as metrics of authenticity in exchange for whether or not something comes from Scripture. So one of the approaches that I like to take with Scripture is simply to read, start, start with, know what your axioms are, and start with a basically an agnostic mind. Like, like I believe in God, and I believe... Um, Bible came from God and that God can't lie. Those are my three axioms. Everything else is up for grabs. And I'm only going to add things to my beliefs that I find in scripture. Does that make sense? And so if you were to do that, you would never come across the phrases, the, the kind of cultural cognitive cultural grammar that the Calvinist uses to express what they believe. You would never come across those phrases. You would never come across phrases like total depravity or sovereignty of God to add to your list. You would never even come across a debate about free will versus sovereignty or versus predestination or versus total depravity. You, you would never even come across that. Um, so if you're just starting with scripture, there are all kinds of things that they have to bring from a paradigm and bring it into scripture and impose it onto scripture. What, what happened... Um, you know, back in the days of Augustine, once you make, once Augustine makes the decision that he's going to try to refute the free will issue of Pelagius, there were a lot of consequences that cascaded down from that. And I think that's kind of an important word. You start, okay, if I'm going to reject free will because of Pelagius, then I have to come up with, a, I'm, I'm going to call it total depravity goes back to his, you know, ostensibly, he goes back to his Manichaean Gnosticism, comes back with that. But what that did is that triggered a cascade of doctrinal events, if you will, that flow out into what the rest of Calvinism is. Now, the positive ones that they've thought about, though they call those the doctrines of grace. But what happens is there are some things that cascaded out of that unintended consequences that they don't realize. Um, you mean well, but then when you start rearranging, you know, when you when you focus and try to optimize to solve one problem and the, trying to solve the, you know, he's trying to optimize for how do I get people saved without free will, you know, without them having the responsibility. So you create a doctrine that optimizes for that one little problem. You don't realize all the other things that it cascades out and affects. So then you have, ultimately you have this whole system. And now you take that system 
which necessarily must cascade from taking that first premise. And now you read that system back into scripture. Now, now you're on a search, not, oh, if I'm going to believe this, then I'm going to have to believe unconditional election. I'm going to have to believe all these things. So now you're going back into scripture to try to find passages. Um, I think Dr. Allen said uh, it's a doctrine in search of a proof text. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's exactly yes. how it happens. So you have like unintended consequences and, and Calvinists will get upset when you point these out because either they haven't thought through them or they don't want people to know, but they happen all the time. Um, to give you a non-theological example, when you, like with COVID, you shut down all the travel, nobody can go anywhere. Well, then the pesticides don't go to Africa and the crops fail. And then the fertilizer doesn't go to India and the crops fail. And then you have starving people over there and then they shut down the transit. And so you they're, they start you know, the food starts rotting because you can't ship it. And then they're culling pigs and chickens at, at thousands and millions of them because we can't ship them because nobody's going to the store while people are starving over there. So because you reacted to a small problem, like I want to optimize for people not getting COVID, you actually created a food supply chain problem that resulted in 2 billion people being affected by diminished um, access to food. That's an unintended consequence, and there's no way COVID would have reached that many people to begin with. Now, that's a non-theological example of how a good intention will bring about a, a bad cascade of consequences that were unintended, and Calvinism is like that. Of the cascaded things that come out of total depravity with, with Augustine, of course, you have the five points of the doctrines of grace and Augustinian predestination and all that, but what you also get is you lose the gospel. Um, because if, you know, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, if, if you're not elect, that's not good news for you. It doesn't matter to you. If you are elect, then Jesus Christ did that as an epiphenomenon of your election. So what really matters, the only real good news you can get in Calvinism is that you're elect. And that's not the gospel we're given. So, and, and I know a a Calvinist would have a very difficult time just probably hearing me say that, but I think it's an unintended consequence that they don't think about that rules out Calvinism as a viable option, as a way of viewing Scripture, because it, it attacks the very heart of the gospel. I don't think it's the color of the carpet or whether or not we should put a, you know, take up the offering or not, or what kind of music we have in church. It's not like that at all. We're talking about what's the gospel here, and if and if Calvinism is true, whether or not your elect is the gospel, irrespective of Christ dying for you or not, because that doesn't matter if you're not elect. Yeah, and I, I think that it's so important to, to really hone in on that, that particular point, is that there are unintended consequences, or what you might even call um, the, the concept or idea that um, the, the implications of one's beliefs. Uh, and a lot of, a lot of Calvinist, more layman type Calvinist, I should say, a new Calvinist possibly. And I know I was probably in this category for, for many of the years that I was a Calvinist, haven't really connected the dots between the claim and the implications that come from that claim. Now, some Calvinists, obviously who are on the online or theology geeks or like we are and sit around and talk through these things quite regularly, they have, they have dealt with all of these implications to the point they have all these answers to all of the, the 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 problems that arise, and that's that's part of the things that I think you're you're addressing is that um, the the newer Calvinist who hasn't really thought about the implications hasn't gone so far as to answer the problem of double predestination, for example, or equal, you know the concept of equal ultimacy. Uh, that that's just a term that's created so as to separate yourself from a double predestinarian, which equal ultimacy is supposed to be significantly different, but I struggle to find a distinction with the difference between uh, the claims of equal ultimacy and double predestination when it comes down to the practical uh, differences between the two. Uh, all that to say is that when you haven't thought through the end game and you haven't thought through, okay, if everyone is born in a condition where they can't respond positively to the call of God to be reconciled from their fallen condition, then you you don't understand that that is that is a that that implies therefore nobody has true responsibility because 
nobody's responsible. Nobody's able to respond to the gospel. They can't. But yet you're still going to treat them as if they are responsible. How do you reconcile that? How do you square that circle, calling people responsible who are born unable to respond? Well, then the unintended consequence is, well, you've got to have imputed guilt. You've got to have this guilt of Adam imputed onto all individuals from birth. That way you can justly condemn them to hell for factors that are beyond their control based upon the imputation of guilt from somebody else. And then you have to deal with all of the verses that talk about how we're not guilty for our parents' sin and our grandparents' sin. And that, that's why you get the, all these, these, these uh, kind of quandaries that are created by the system itself um, that, that become confounding to most people when they hear it for the very first time. Uh, and why many people, I think, re react so vehemently against the Calvinistic claims is because they're trying to think through all the implications and what that must mean if you just simply adopt this concept and idea that all people are born without the ability to respond to God himself and yet are judged for eternity uh, for that very rejection that they apparently can't do anything about because of the way they were born. And I don't know how else you get around that. Uh, so that, Kevin, that makes me think of, uh, can you hear me? Oh yeah. 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 You'd, yeah, you'd cut, cut out for a second there, but I can hear you now. Go ahead. I mean, that makes me think of this, you know, there's another word game that gets played with, when the issue of free will comes up, I'm a not, I'm not a proponent of Christians starting with the idea of free will that actually usually when, when dealing with me anyway, that usually comes from the Calvinists. They presume that I start there. I don't start there. I'm, I have an agnostic approach to free will and I look at scripture just to see what it says. I, I don't care which way it goes. I'll, I'll, I'll believe no free will or free, whatever it says, I'll believe it. So I really don't care. I don't have a dog in the fight, if you will. But the, the shell game there is that the, the terminology, again, the, the, cognitive cultural grammar we use free will libertarian free will today well that terminology wasn't used when the bible was being penned they didn't speak in terms of free will or not they spoke they spoke about things in terms of responsibility so right. it's it's kind of a way like saying the responsibility it's kind of a way to shift things away from the way the bible addresses it and try to reframe the mind into how things are talked about today and then bring that back to scripture to try to say see look it's not there well <laughs> That's uh, that lingo wasn't there yet. So what lingo was there? And it was the obvious implication that man is responsible to to respond to what's offered to him and has. And there's no reason that man can't do that. Um, there's all kinds what? of things that man can do. Man can man men can do wonderful things like save children from fires and stuff. Why? Why is believing the gospel in this special category of things that he can't do? Where'd that special category right. come from? <laughs> of all the things that man can do. But man is absolutely responsible. And I think shifting the language away from free will, it's not about free will versus sovereignty. It's about scriptural authority. And then we look at what, how does scripture frame this issue? What wording does it use? And then start to uh, use Shane that, in the that side way. chat there. He asked the question, and uh, either one of you, Ke Kevin or uh, Brad, if you want to jump in here, feel free. Um, he said, "What verse would you go to first to support uh, to show uh, a Calvinist that the Bible supports the concept of free will?" I think you answered that question somewhat already, Kevin. But um, if, if if yeah, I don't believe in starting with free will. You start with scriptural authority, and you wait until. You know, you, you start with a liminal mind where I don't know whether there's free will or not. And if the Bible doesn't tell you there's um, total depravity, but it lays all these expectations on you and doesn't give you a reason why you can't do them, the burden of proof is on them. The Calvinist is the one injecting something that they positively want you to believe. Therefore, the burden of proof is on the Calvinist to show where total depravity is. And until they can show right. that, remain in a liminal mindset on the issue. Yeah, because it does it does seem reasonable to me to suggest that, okay, if, if a person's fallen, which we all believe everybody's fallen, and then God brings a message to fallen people, calling them to be reconciled from their fallen condition, it, the, 
the implication seems to be that you're responsible to what you do with that call to be reconciled from that fall, unless you can find some verse that says, by God's decree, you were born incapable, morally speaking, spiritually incapable of responding to that call, unless he picked you before you were ever born unconditionally and irresistibly or effectually gives you some kind of miraculous faith or work of grace that causes you to believe. Um, it seems like the burden is on you to find where in the text it clearly states those things. Um, and so it, it, it's wrong, probably wrong minded to say, OK, hey, prove free will. Um, the, rather just turn it around and say, OK, no, prove total inability from birth. I think that's that that's the burden on you to, to prove that, because the natural Absolutely. implication of the reading of, seems to be that you're responsible for what you do with the words of God. And he calls you to repentance and faith. And so it seems to treat you as if you can repent and believe. He marvels at their unbelief as if they he, they should have been believing. Uh, it doesn't make much sense for him to marvel at something they were born incapable of doing by the sovereign decree. But uh, nevertheless, he does. Uh, Brad, were you going to say something there? It seems like you were leaning forward there. Yeah, I was. I was just going to just real quick, just kind of point back to Kevin's video that was that was impactful for me. Um, it, when I was reformed, if you would have come to me and say free will, I would say, show me free will in the Bible. Show me. And I don't I don't know um, that you can. And so I'll, I'll just just personal testimony. Kind of what happened for me uh, was and just to kind of kind of point back to to your real guests, your, your true guests here today uh, was when Kevin said predestination is in the Bible. OK, predestination is there, but it's not defined by the Bible the way that you define it as a as a Calvinist or a, a, as the way Augustine uh, defined it, right? It's, it's, there was, there was some segment and I'm, I'm, I'm having to go back a couple years now in Kevin's video. It was you, when you hear the word predestination, what comes to mind? And it's all this, you know, whatever, 1700 years of theological baggage that you bring in and you eisegete it into the text. And so the thing that was so impactful for me, if somebody's acting, asking just pragmatically, um, how would you go about talking to someone like myself? you would have to do sola scriptura and scripture interpret scripture, which is exactly what Kevin had done with that, where he said, okay, well, here's how the Bible uses predestination. Here's what it says. Uh, you are destined beforehand and then to adoption. And then that whole video is about, you know, what is adoption? How's that defined? Um, paired with, again, if somebody's trying to have this conversation with somebody, I would point them, go get Grudem Systematic Theology and read Ordo Salutis and understand it. And then read Ephesians one, where it says you're predestined to adoption and those types of things. And so, so if somebody came at me, I'm, t I'm just, uh, and I think this is part of the reason for so much of the, the back and forth is so if somebody comes and says, show me free will, it's like, dude, I can show you free will offering. That's the time it shows up in the Bible. But the, the tactic for that, that opened my eyes was, no, I'm going to make you define predestination according to the Bible. I'm going to make you define adoption according to the way the Bible does it. Um, and I, right. I know you guys, you guys were on the total inability, total depravity side, but that was it was the predestination side that that kind of got the foot in the door for me. Right. Yeah. yeah well, well said, uh, Zach that Avery, which I, I think you were the same thing for me as well, brought me out of Calvinism. Go ahead, Lee. Yeah. And yeah, and especially with Ephesians 1, which y'all were highlighting on Ephesians 1, um, once you understand that predestination can be about what God is predestined for those who believe, in other words, the destination is set beforehand for whosoever believes in him. Um, it makes it really simple. Okay, justification, sanctification, glorification. Uh, sanctification is a part of adoption, obviously, um, and, and, and glorification. Um, then if I, if I know that God is destined beforehand of these spiritual blessings for those who are in Christ Jesus, it's it's a really simple uh, understanding. At least I can, at least as a Calvinist, I can say I get it. I understand where the non-Calvinist is coming from. Now I understand he doesn't believe that certain individuals are predestined to be believers. Instead, what they believe is that that all believers are predestined to justification, sanctification, and glorification because that is what God has planned from the very beginning for both Jew and Greek, uh, male and female, slave free. It does not matter. All things uh, have been determined beforehand for those who are in Christ. Uh, but it, it's it's your responsibility to put your faith in Christ. And and when you hear the word of God, that that's something you should do. Uh, Zach Avery, I think, is one of our resident Calvinists, if I remember correctly. 
Um, and, and forgive me if I'm wrong on that, Zach, maybe he's not just forget that I said that I have no idea where he's Zach stands. Let me just say that. Um, did Christ, did Jesus die for those he knew would be in hell? So if, if God, if God has all knowledge, future knowledge, and he knows, uh, Joe heathen is going to hell, then did Jesus die for Do Joe heathen knowing he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't believe and thus be saved. Uh, how would you answer that, Kevin? So there's a couple issues there. And the one issue, the first thing that pops up is that people have the miss. One of the, one of the vulnerabilities you have to have in order to become a Calvinist is several wrong things about doctrine as a precondition before you get, you know, confused about Calvinism. And one of those things is that, um, the atonement saves and the atonement is not what saves or that having your sins paid for saves you when having your sins paid for does not glorify you it does not regenerate you it does not justify you okay so what christ did on the cross when he when christ died on the cross we're told a couple of times that jesus christ reconciled the world to himself we're told in colossians 1 and we're told over in second corinthians chapter 5 God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It, like in the book of Matthew, when the guy, he went out and he saw the field and he saw the treasure in the field and he bought the whole field. Christ did not die to pay for sins. Christ died to pay for the cosmos. When uh, in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ has the keys of hell and death. So he didn't just die for specific sins or for anybody's particular sins or or for particular people he died for the cosmos he owns the he he got the title deed to the cosmos if you will and when it comes time to throw death and hell into the lake of fire he has to own them when he does that and in luke chapter 4 matthew chapter 4 satan's talking to jesus and he says you know i'll give you all these things because all these things have been delivered unto me well was satan lying when he said that well how did how did all those things get out of the control of the devil and back into the hands of Jesus Christ? It is kind of a selfish, anthropocentric viewpoint to think that Christ just died for men when they're, the entire world, the entire cosmos is what was at stake. So Christ, the, the presumption, the false presumption is that if Christ pays for your sins, you're saved. No, Christ paying for your sins, which the Bible never says you paid for any sins, but if Christ whatever Christ does for our sins knocks the sins out of the way as a necessary precondition so that a person can be saved. It is um, necessary, but not sufficient, if you will. It, um, yeah. Yeah. In order, sine qua non, if you will, element, component of salvation that Christ would die for the sins of the world and for the world and for the cosmos reconciling the world to himself. Um, that that's that's the issue right there people people what the problem that we have in the book of romans if you're reading through the book of romans you're thinking okay all have sinned and come short of the glory of god there's two problems right there there's sin and the glory of god by the time you get finished with romans chapter five your sin problem is taken care of you if, if you had never been taught theology, you had never read any, you know, never been to Sunday school, never been taught the approved way of what to think, you would be sitting with bated breath being like, okay, I, I got the sin problem taken care of. Now what about the glory? It says I fall short of the glory of God. Where does that come through? And we don't get, you know, it gets mentioned in chapter five, but we don't get any details on the glory uh, until, until chapter eight, verse 17 when he starts talking about the glory and then you're predestined to the adoption, that's when you're like, Oh, okay. So that's, that's my guaranteed future. The problem is not having your sins taken care. Of. That's not the problem. The problem is there's no way to get a person to glory and Christ dying for a person is a necessary prerequisite so that they can be glorified. That's just the first chain of the step of, of events. Right. And furthermore, yeah. you know, some people make the mistake of saying that, um, you know, unbelief was the only sin that Christ didn't die for. And that's, uh, <laughs> that's not the case at all. Christ died for everything that ever was. What the reason unbelief condemns a person is not because it's not a sin that Jesus didn't die for. It's because by faith, we have access into this grace. Faith is the point of access into the grace. Romans chapter five, verse two. 
That's why faith, that's why belief is essential. It's not that unbelief is a sin that Jesus didn't pay for. It's that faith is the ticket. That's the that's yeah. what grants you the access to the grace. Well, and, and the simplest analogy for this, I think, is the one Christ uses in John chapter 3, when, when he says, you know, just as the serpent was lifted up on the pole, uh, so too, when I'm lifted up, um, you may be healed through the provision. Uh, so if you were bitten by a serpent, you're under the curse of the, the, the venom. Uh, how do you get healing? You look to the provision. Well, in the same way, we're under the curse of sin. How do you healing? You look to the provision. And, and I've used the analogy before. If some, you know, snake bitten Jew during that, that time would have gone on a journey and gotten bit by a viper and uh, decides, well, you know what? I don't want to go back around the hill. You know, it's going to be a two hour walk to look at the serpent. That's just superstition. I'm just not going to do that. And he dies of snake venom. And he gets up to heaven and he says, well, God, why didn't you provide atonement for me? Why didn't you provide healing for me? What is God going to say? I did. <laughs> you refused to look so as to be healed. It was provided for you. And in the same way, anyone who ends up in hell is not going to be able to say to God, God, why didn't you die for me? Why didn't you provide for me? Because I think God could, could rightly say, I did provide for you. I did buy you. I did uh, provide all you needed for salvation. The reason you ended up separated from me is because you refuse to look to the the provision of healing um, that I've provided through Christ through my Son, um, and so that that's a, a great uh, a great way I think of approaching that 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 issue is to understand that the, the it's not just the extent of the atonement it's all the, also the application of the atonement which is through faith um, an important point Dustin thanks for the uh, donation he says this Dustin Paulson says if man's free will is not free then God's punishment of man's predetermined crimes against him is wholly unjust or uh, unholy. A judge cannot be counted as just if he predetermines the criminals and their crimes. Um, and that seems intuitively obvious. If I if I can somehow manipulate Brad's desires uh, or control Brad's desires in such a way that he's going to do what I have determined beforehand for him to do, and then I sit as a judge over Brad for his actions, I think all of us would just intuitively know that's not just, that's not right. It's it, that that would that would be a lacking of character on my part to somehow causally determine for Brad to do something bad and then sit in judgment for Brad's wrongdoing. And usually, what Calvinists will do when approached with that kind of logic is just to say, "Well, who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God?" Plucking Romans nine out of its context and applying it to this kind of uh, uh, clearly unjust way in which God supposedly works. Um, Kevin, how, how, would, how would you respond to those who um, try to paint the predestinarian view of God as even God predestines um, our, our, our desires? Uh, he, he, he absolutely, whatever comes to pass, according to the Westminster Confession, is in accordance with what God has decreed unchangeably for it to be before the world even began. How, how do you respond to that kind of view of Calvinism? Right. I uh, just did a, I was just dealing with uh, London Baptist Confession, chapter three, paragraph one recently, where God hath freely in himself of his own free counsel uh, determined all things whatsoever comes to pass. If that's true, then whatever I do is God's will. Whether I'm regenerated or not, whatever I do is God's will and everything pleases God. Uh, essentially, everything that I th think is what God wants me to think. Therefore, everything that I think is God's thoughts. Everything that I do is God's actions. I'm just an extension of God. It kind of goes in, it looks, sounds like a panentheism to me where God is at least in everything if God isn't everything. But I don't see what, what you could do other than lacking the attributes of God. I don't see how you could be anything but God. I mean, every if everything, there. There is no rebellion in that case. There's no way to act outside of the will of God. Everything is the will of God because that's what the paradigm says. Well, and the way they, they would no way might to deal not with that. The will of God. There's no way to not please. Yeah, and, and the way they might deal with that, Kevin, is to is to push back and say, well, there's two different kinds of will. Um, and, and you were not judged based upon the secret or the creative will of God. You're judged based upon the prescriptive or external will of God. And so God externally says, I don't want you to lie. I don't want you to kill. I don't want you to steal. I don't want you to do all of these things. 
but in his secret decreative will, yes, he has sovereignly uh, brought all these things to pass uh, in a mysterious way that we just don't get it. Um, and so how do you respond to that when, when a Calvinist tries to say, well, you just don't understand Calvinism because you're trying to say God is, is, is doing these things, but he's doing it through secondary causes. Um, and maybe, maybe philosophically, you're just not quite on the same level playing level as they are in understanding these things. How, how do you respond to those kinds of things? Well, anytime, anytime the paradigm of Calvinism contradicts scripture, they're always going to try to come up with two different categories to put things into. And that's where the decretive will of God and the prescriptive will of God come from. So, or the, the preceptive will of God come from, um, they need to break those two things up. So first of all, it would make God a liar. And I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example that is not the preceptive will of God. It's actually a statement about the will of God in first Thessalonians chapter four, verse three, it says, this is the will of God even your sanctification, that ye abstain from fornication. That is not a command to abstain from fornication. It's not a directive to abstain from fornication. It is a statement about the will of God. And the writer of the book of you know, Paul does not, does not see fit to go through and tell you which kind of the will of God, because there's no two kinds to worry about. And that, that goes all the way back to the first two axioms. God exists. God can't lie, and the Bible comes from God. If I have a statement from the Bible that says this is the will of God, and then if I go out and commit fornication as a Christian, I know that that's not the will of God because I have a clear statement telling me it's not the will of God. I know that. I'm supposed to abstain from fornication. So that's not a prescript. It's not a precept. To, it's not telling me to do something. It's a statement about the will of God. So I, I like that verse for that reason. And once again, if I believed in Calvinism, I would essentially, I mean, I don't, I don't see how R.C. Sproul gets away from why isn't that antinomianism? Because if I believed in Calvinism, then if I go commit fornication, that's the will of God, too, because no matter what the Bible says, I know he decreed it. Right. So that's one of, you, you have no Bible. Yeah. And that, that's one of the reasons I, I point to Jeremiah 19.5. When in the ESV, which is the the favorite of among Calvinists, uh, it it literally says when they're killing their children yeah. to Malek, it literally decree. says that's right. Yeah, it literally says he does not command or decree it. Um, and yet on on the systematic, uh, at least within their confessions, they say God decrees all things. But of course, when I bring that up to Calvinists, they say, well, that's a different kind of decree. And so even when you use their own language so with again, their another own category. favorite now version, there's two categories of decrees, right? And, and so you, you have different, more... a, a paradigm serves three functions. A paradigm responds to reality, it conserves itself, and it resolves dissonance. So when you are, as long as your paradigm responds to reality or helps you deal with scripture, it's functional. And then, and then when you encounter some kind of dissonance, you got to make a decision. Now, do I conserve the paradigm or do I modify the paradigm? So if I modify the paradigm to better respond to reality, now if I'm a Calvinist, for example, I might change the system a little bit to, to better match what I found in Scripture. But if I, if, I, if I conserve the paradigm and don't change it, then I'm, I mean, the technical term for that in cognitive science is resorting to delusion. I'm, I'm deciding to not believe the evidence in favor of the paradigm and no matter what the evidence says, I will find a way to justify the paradigm. I will make up two different kinds of decrees. I will make up two different kinds of wills of God. I'll make up whatever I have to. I don't care as long as I conserve the paradigm. And it's it's like uh, one of those patients that uh, their arms on fire and they're de they're in denial of it, you know, <laughs> because they have one of those body dysmorphic diseases. That is delusion. It's the same thing. And I'm not using the word delusion pejoratively. It's actually what the cognitive scientists call it. So if you're following a paradigm and you won't modify it no matter what, um, you, you have no Bible there in that case. Either. Well, in, in logic, might, that would be... Might, might not even have it to respond to. Yeah, in logic, that would be kind of like the the concept or idea of unfalsifiability or um, when, when you can't falsify something because, like you said, if you've got, if you've got two kinds of call... Um, you know, two kinds of will of God, two kinds of love. Right, uh, right. You know, two you kinds have, of you, everything where scripture contradicts what I believe. <laughs> right. Then, then no matter how many times I bring up verses that directly contradict what you think about calling 
or love or will or whatever we're talking about, you can just take it and put it into that box over here. And so you, you've ultimately made your view unfalsifiable. No matter how many verses I find that talk about a decree, uh, if we uncovered a new, uh, another letter from Paul to the Corinthian church or something like that, and, and it, it was one of the autographs even, I mean, it was absolutely. And all of a sudden you get, you get all this stuff about, Hey, I've been hearing about, uh, some of you misinterpreting my understanding of predestination and this, this, and this. And, and he just started explaining through the call and decree. And I believe God, uh, has decreed for, uh, people to have the freedom of choice and de decreed this and decreed that and call that they could just take those those verses and just drop them in the categories that they've already pre-created because no matter how clear the scripture is about what uh, we believe and say if you've created that grid and those two uh, two different categories you always have a place to put it no matter what the bible says and, and, and therefore it becomes no bible that's exactly right, right. Yeah. You're going to believe that no matter what the book says. I mean, if, if God really wanted to say all, how would he say it? How would he say it? There's no way God can say all and a Calvinist believe it. No way he can do it. Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> it's, 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 it, it, and that, this is the, that's the, the frustrating part of dealing with um, those who interpret the scriptures differently than you do is I can actually concede what you're saying with, okay, I, I, I agree that this verse is probably talking about, um, all without distinction, both Jews and Gentiles. Yeah, that's probably a, an emphasis on what he's saying here. Yes, it's it's people all, but that doesn't prove, therefore, um, that it doesn't. It means uh, certain individuals from all groups. I mean, in other words, just because we can see this concept or idea that that in the mind of Paul, yeah, he's talking about both Jews and Gentiles here. It doesn't mean, therefore, he's only talking about a select few from the Jews and select few from the Gentiles. It, it's it's an inclusive kind of word. It's 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 a it's a, an expression of God's love for the world. It's an expression of good news for all people, um, and and to make it all uh, um, some of all types of people it makes it very ex exclusive and very narrow in its focus. When it seems like the basic reading and the tenor of the text is good news for all and inclusive for all, and of the very promise of of Genesis uh, twelve three is that I have chosen you to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. That certainly seems to be inclusive, not exclusive, uh, in even the original promise that he makes to Abraham. And I don't that know how you get around that. That brings up another, this is kind of off topic, but you mentioned Genesis 12, 3, and that occurred to me when Sproul, in the video that you played, Sproul is talking about Knox, Luther, Calvin, and Edwards, and at least three of those were anti-Semites. And he wants to talk about the uh, the awakening that they had. Well, how do you reconcile them being anti? -Semite? Why follow those men? Again, it goes back to scriptural authority. Why follow those men who are clearly in violation of Genesis twelve three? Anyway, that's kind of a side note. No, oh, it's a good point. Well, guys, I'd like to I'd, I'd love to do something like this with you again, Kevin. Maybe when we can work out the technical difficulties. I am glad you uh, glad you were able to find a, a place for us to at least uh, continue our conversation and uh, and and also get your exercise. I mean, it looks like you've you've probably walked a block or two. Yeah, my house is old and the signal doesn't go through it very well, so I got to I got to walk outside. And the mosquitoes started getting me, so I got to move around. <laughs> yeah, keep moving. You sound like <laughs> New Orleans sounds a lot like Texas. Matter of fact, one of the uh, the commenters on the side was like, "Are they going to have uh, uh, um, s subtitles for our, us Northerners so that we can understand them <laughs> from the South?" Oh my! Well, we got well, Brad here. Brad's here. Brad's here. Brad's here to interpret. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Montana's in the house, buddy. I got you covered. <laughs> Well, um, as we close down here, um, first, Brad, is there anything you would like to share as we close? And then I'll, and then I'll let Kevin have the last word. No, uh, I, I guess the only thing I would, I would add, and just again, just to point back to how, how Kevin had helped me was when you start talking about two wills or whatever, the, the, if you're in a, in a conversation with an opponent on any theological issue, I would try to move it out of the categories and out of the labels and go, just what passage, man? Just what passage are we talking about? All right, just there's two wills. Okay, sh what passage? Like, let's go to the passage and let's go to the text. And, I, you know, I've heard Kevin just really emphasize that in this talk here today is just, you know, just authority of Scripture, authority of Scripture. Like, let's just go to the text. And, you know, when you start talking about all and all without distinction or all without exception or, or 
whichever, you know, it's like, okay, you know what? Those are both in there. That does happen uh, with the Greek word pantos. That's, that is a thing. But what causes you to see that is, I think you guys covered it, trying to, trying to fit in things into categories. And so I just, I would encourage your listeners like, Hey, just, just go to text. Like if you're, if you're back and forth with somebody, like, let's just go to the passage and see, should we be interpreting predestination this way or adoption this way or election this way or whatever? And so, yeah, just, just don't talk in terms of categories, talk in terms of like do exegesis. Jesus yeah. loves exegesis. Yes, Jesus does love it. And, and uh, Kevin is one of the best at that. Um, he does a really good job going straight through the text. Um, I, he and I may have some issues or differences in the good cop, bad cop approach of things. Um, but I think both of us uh, didn't come out of Calvinism or leave Calvinism for emotional reasons. Neither one of us is all that em emotional based. I think, Brad, you're the same way. It's, it, it was really more of what does the Bible say? And it's the same reason I was a Calvinist for 10 years is really, I thought this is what the Bible is teaching. So I was going to be uh, as clear with the text as I could be. Um, and so Kevin, I'm going to give you the last word before I do that. Jay, thank you for your donation. And uh, that would be a, a fun discussion with Billy Wendell and Matt Chisholm, William Lane Craig. If any of you can arrange for all of those people to be in one room together, I will be there with them. <laughs> so, uh, but that would be a, a great uh, discussion to have. Uh, and there are several, by the way, Kevin, you may not be able to see this in the side chat, but there are several people who are saying they love you and uh, appreciate your work. Uh, Randall uh, DeBell is saying uh, he loves you and uh, and several others uh, commending you for your work that you do. And so uh, um, I wanted you to be aware of that, too. But uh, Kevin, give us the last word as we uh, close this thing down. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate all that. Um Think, you know, the topic you brought up was, you know, different approaches to dealing with Calvinism. And something I want to emphasize is that um, it takes every joint in the body. In Ephesians 4, it says, speaking the truth in love. And the that which edifies the body by the time you get to verse 16 in Ephesians 4 is every joint. Everybody's speaking. Everybody's speaking the truth in love. So there's there is no one way to do things that's better than the other. The, actually, the one way is that everybody get involved. Everybody say something. Everybody um, try to conduct your own sense making. Listen to other people. Separate the signal from the noise. Try to rearticulate what you hear that signal and in a in a better, higher fidelity way, and and keep the circle going in a positive, self reinforcing feedback loop so that the truth is becomes resonant and feeds and grows. So. Um, I, th I think everybody saying something about this, the more the, the more the merrier. There's no right way to do it except that we all do something. Well said. And and if we had, uh, we, we have the majority. I mean, I mean uh, sometimes you talk about the silent majority. There is a silent majority of non-Calvinist in uh, our world today. And uh, a lot, like we've already mentioned, just I don't think know uh, the issues well enough to address them. And so I am thankful for, uh, for men like uh, my my two guests who are willing to speak out on this, uh, despite the um, impact it may have on their own ministries, either positive or negative in some cases, as uh, Brad's testimony where he lost funding from uh, Acts 29 and had to kind of start again from afresh, uh, leaving behind his uh, his background. Um, and and I and I know that can be difficult. I, I really uh, uh, was fearful with trembling when I came out of the closet of leaving Calvinism, so to speak. And, uh, and some people may be watching this and are in that uh, quandary right now of kind of worrying about uh, what's next for them, especially if they're raised in a Presbyterian background or in a Calvinistic Reformed background. And let me just encourage you that, um, you know, we do believe God is sovereign in that he is there to help us and redeem our mistakes. Uh, he can bring good out of even the mistakes that we make. And uh, God is proven to be uh, one who is able to bring good out of my bad mistakes throughout my life. And I know he can do the same for you. So thanks again, Brad, Kevin, for, for joining me on today's program. Let's do it again sometime. And, uh, and we'll pray for, for better technology all along the way as we have those discussions. But again, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank God you. God bless. See you next time. Bye-bye. We'll see you guys.